Apple and Google want to track the virus using Bluetooth low energy. What is the Earn It Act? And the Dark Nexus botnet continues to grow. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morrison. This is ThreatWire for April 14th, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. How far would you be willing to allow for tracking your movements to track COVID-19? Apple and Google have chosen to collaborate on a contact tracing tool that would allow for tracking of the virus spread between people. The two tech giants are developing a smartphone platform that will allow for this tracking on Android and iOS for you users who opt in. This will use Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE, to track physical contacts between people. Now they explain it like this. Two people meet up in person. Person one tests positive for COVID-19 and enters that test result into an application. The two phones for person one and two exchange anonymous identifier beacons, which frequently change. A few days later, person one's phone uploads the last 14 days of keys for their broadcast beacons to the cloud temporarily with their consent. Their goal is to use tech to track each person an infected person has been in contact with using devices everyone already has in their pockets and purses. Now, Google and Apple aim to make this contact tracing private by using cryptographic schemes to uphold the privacy of individual users. Many privacy advocates, though, are rightfully concerned. A platform that tracks the movements and interactions of millions of individuals must be 100% voluntary and decentralized, with no major power holding the keys to a centralized database. Now, this platform does not collect names, locations, or other PII. It simply uses BLE to swap identifier beacons. And these beacons will change every 15 minutes to prevent wireless device tracking, which was a big concern of mine. So would person two find out who tested positive? Well, according to Google, person two would get a notification saying that they were in contact with someone who tested positive when their phone downloads matching identifier beacons. Both companies say user consent is required. It does not collect location data or PII. A, and I quote, a list of people you've been in contact with never leaves your phone. People who test positive are not identified to other users or the companies. It will only be used for the pandemic, at least that's what they say, and it's cross-platform for both operating systems. But if person two has a human readable list, for example, of people that they had come in contact with on their phone, could they too release that data even if they did not test positive and none of their contacts actually opted in? That's an obvious concern, as is the potential of testing positive and having keys be targeted in their delivery due to the size of the published keys. According to signal creator Moxie Marlin Spike that would account for hundreds of megs, which seems untenable. If downloads are targeted, that would mean that some kind of location data is actually being transferred. But according to Apple, the proximity to other devices is being sent and collected, not the actual location of the devices. Lastly is the potential of malicious behavior by trolls, saying that they have tested positive to start a panic. If people never come in contact with each other but are within the same vicinity, like two folks that live in the same apartment complex, could that also create some kind of fake positives? Bluetooth has its own security flaws, so even with the changing identifier, I am still concerned about its usage. Now, Google and Apple posted some short documentation that explains their cryptography specification. I will link to that below. The companies are planning to release this in May to the public health authorities to develop applications using the platform for them to be released in both application stores. The OS developers also plan to add this functionality into their operating systems as something that could be turned on in the settings as well. I would love to know what your thoughts on this is. What are your concerns? Leave those down in the comments below. A new bill has been introduced to legislation by Senators Lindsey Graham, a Republican of South Carolina, and Richard Blumenthal, remember that name, a Democrat of Connecticut, meant to create a commission 
to prevent, reduce, and respond to child exploitation online, which is a laudable and a very important goal. The National Commission on Online Child Exploitation Prevention would be tasked with developing best practices that companies running platforms would be required to adhere to. Now, while many online social media platforms, for example, have taken their own initiatives to stem bad actors, there's no legal requirement to do so other than what's involved with Section 230. Now, Section 230 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996's Title V, Communications Decency Act, is a current law that provides protections for platforms against legal liability for user-generated content, with notable exceptions. It does not protect platforms from coming under fire within federal criminal law, liabilities based on intellectual property law, communications privacy law, or sex trafficking laws. As it stands, Section 230 is quite clear in what is and is not considered protected. But this new bill could undermine Section 230 by putting many companies at serious legal risk or forcing them to undermine their own security. The Earn It Act stands for, quote, Eliminating Abusive and Rampant Neglect of Interactive Technologies Act of 2020, and it allows for this commission to develop these best practices, then turn them over to the Attorney General, Secretary of Homeland Security, and the FTC Chair to approve or veto them. Congress would then quickly need to write these into law. Now, companies would be required to adhere to these best practices or show that they had implemented reasonable measures to prevent child exploitation. Since this is a very commendable goal, why would you scrutinize it? The Earn It Act gives a large portion of authority to those in power that are against end-to-end -end encryption, specifically the Attorney General William Barr. Now, the bill would give him the ability, along with his two co-chairs, to approve or veto practices that platforms would need to accept and could potentially put encryption in the crosshairs. Now, child exploitation is already covered under Section 230, deeming that if a platform knowingly distributes material or even if they just find the material material on their platform, it must be reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and they must cooperate with law enforcement investigations. The bill, in its entirety, can be read on the EFF website. Now, the response has not been surprising. While the Earn It Act has been quietly gaining steam due to other news, the EFF and the encrypted messaging platform Signal has significantly opposed its adoption. Signal has stated that end-to-end -end encryption is fundamental to the safety, security, and privacy of conversations worldwide, and the Earn It Act would likely end in disallowing that kind of privacy technology. Now, while not certain the act is broad enough and controlled by people who would likely want to see this happen, Ironically, Senator Richard Blumenthal, remember that name again, is also calling for an investigation into Zoom for not fulfilling their promises of offering end-to-end -end encryption. Huh. Now, while this does not necessarily make it contradictory, the Earn It Act could hamper encryption and incentivize companies to make changes to their platforms that would keep them from being held liable, again, to something that is covered under Section 230 already. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my supporters over at patreon.com slash threatwire. My hush puppy perk level patrons are awesome. They always send in these adorable fur baby photos. I love them. Keep them coming. And if you want to support Threatwire, but you don't want to be a Patreon supporter, check out snubsy.com slash shop to get t-shirts, stickers, and even my own digital photography, all of which supports the shows. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate each and every one of you for the support. Shout out to Justin on the Threatwire Patreon page for suggesting this security story for the show. Thank you so much, Justin. According to a report and a white paper by Bitdefender, a new botnet has already compromised hundreds of ASUS, D-Link, and Dasan Zone routers during its short lifespan of only three months so far, while it's also infected IoT devices as well. 
It's called Dark Nexus, and it's using a similar technique to what we saw with the Qbot banking malware, as well as the Mirai botnet. Now, the difference is that Dark Nexus is also persistent and it evades detection. This new botnet delivers payloads dynamically based on a victim's machine, and it's been compiled for 12 different CPU architectures, meaning that it can successfully run on a multitude of different machines. Researchers suspect that this is going to be used for DDoSing for higher services. Dark Nexus uses Telnet credential stuffing to exploit compromised devices which are vulnerable to things like a command injection vulnerability or remote code execution attacks. It is actively being updated though, with 30 new versions in just those three months. It uses DDoS attacks that hide traffic, pretending to be regular browser packets, and once infecting a machine, it continues to evade detection detection by pretending to be a busy box utility. It creates persistence by removing restart permissions to prevent devices from restarting, which could be overlooked on IoT or server devices. It also has the ability to whitelist processes while killing others in order to maintain its hold on a machine. In order for the attacker to have control of the botnet, Dark Nexus has command and control servers that issue remote commands to infected devices, and details about that device are shared back to that server. Now, researchers estimate that Dark Nexus has infected over 1,000 devices so far, mostly in South Korea, which is relatively small compared to Mirai, which hit over 600,000 in its life cycle. Researchers suggest that this can be attributed to a botnet author named Greek Helios due to early binaries including this name. Now, before I leave, I want to say thank you so much to Devin, Paul, Ian, Mad Infosec, Flailing Tools, Brandon, and Rabbit, who joined the Patreon team this week. Thank you so much to each and every one of you. You are awesome. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I am Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet. Bye.